Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Joyful Balance podcast here with your host, I'm Mira. And, and I've got. Hi, Denise. Um, so, in the last couple of episodes, we've just really introduced who we are, what we're all about. And today I get to interview Denise all about her journey. <laughs> Be nice. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about today is just basically your journey to becoming a, a cognitive hypnotherapist, which I'm really understanding, uh, wanting to understand way more about because I know very little. Um, and yeah, looking forward to understanding how you came to, into hypnotherapy, what it's all about, and yeah, just and learning more about who you are. Um, so guys, we really hope you enjoy the episode. And without further ado, uh, Denise, can you tell me a bit about how does hypnotherapy work? It's that beautiful thing of mind control. <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> no, sorry, guys. Spoiler alert. There is no pendulum and there is no crazy, you know, pattern that you go into and then you get sucked into. No. So um, hypnotherapy is, um, in simple terms, another form of psychotherapy. So mm -hmm. it's another form of a, of a talking therapy. And it is predominantly a, a fusion between a talking therapy and hypnosis so that's why the term itself is hypnotherapy it's because you utilize hypnosis as part of the therapeutic um, sessions and then you in a nutshell learn what are the um objectives and outcomes that the client desires and then you agree on them in the talking part and you practice them with them in the hypnosis part so it's basically another way of cementing the learnings and the behaviors and the patterns that they would like to achieve that's really interesting and it kind of oh there are just so many questions i want to ask but i suppose what i'm wondering and it kind of leads into my next question is how do you use hypnotherapy to help in, and I know it's not all what hypnotherapy is useful or not all what you use it for but how do you use um, hypnotherapy for example to help someone change their habits mm. so I think initially you understand what this habit is so yep. let's choose one at random um, nail biting so okay. that's, a, that's a habit you do. And when you ask people who engage in this habit, they would basically say, I don't know what happened. I was just mm -hmm. watching TV and three moments later, I had no nails. They, they, it's, okay. it's, it's an activity that happens without much awareness sometimes. Mm -hmm. The scope in therapy, in hypnotherapy, would be to first create the environment for them to become more aware of it as in which are the triggers why is it happening is it only when you're driving is it only when you're watching tv is it only when you know you're spacing out as i'm using quotation marks here as mm. some people say so you first identify the habit second you identify the triggers and you problem solve together with a client what would you like it to turn into? What would be more helpful for you? What would be more healthy for you? And for mm -hmm. example, with a nail biting, they'll say, I want to stop nail biting. Okay, fine. So you go through the journey and they are very clear that that's what they are wanting to, uh, to achieve. And for this particular habit, and uh, it, there are many different ways to handle other habits such as disordered eating or anything else. For okay. this particular habit, you go down the route of, what we call habit reversal therapy, where we take one habit and replace it with a helpful one. Okay. And that we practice in hypnosis in the sense when you are there sitting on the sofa, which is your trigger, and you are just going to take your hand and taking them to you know, your mouth because you're mm -hmm. getting ready. That's the moment where you clench your fist. Okay. How are you going to bite your nails with a clenched fist? Mm -hmm. Doesn't work. So you're building something like that or count a habit, so to say. Okay. But this is not always the case. You can, you can create what we call cues and habit cues across many things. Mm. And that is, the, that is the beauty of practicing it in hypnosis because you're practicing as now 
I'm yes. just getting ready to get on stage, talk to a group of people. I'm really petrified, but I know my cue is to, let's say, squeeze my right fist three times and that already soothes my nervous system. And I will get okay. on stage a little bit calmer because I've practiced it. I know how yeah. I can do it. And like, take us, I'm just really interested, like take us oh. through an example session, like when you're starting to use hypnotherapy to help someone uh, get to the point where, you know, that then they know that rather than going to bite their nails, they just automatically clench their fist. Like what does an, yeah, what does a session look like when you start out? Well, initially we, we have a, you know, introduction consultation uh, time where uh, it's like taking everything into context what is happening? Have there ever been, you know, uh, important events that may have triggered it? Have questions such as, have you always bitten your nails? Do you remember a time when you didn't? Or whatever the, the thing you are trying to address is, that mm. first starts, uh, starts to form the consultation. And what would you like to achieve? So we, in the type of practice I have, which is cognitive behavioral hypnotherapy, I identify very much with the problem is now, and I want my client to be able to work on it, fix it, manage it now. As okay. in, I don't dwell too much on to the past unless it's very relevant. And mm -hmm. we are focusing on the present moment. That's why from the moment you, I hear about your life story, your medication, your health concerns, I very quickly jump into why are you here? What mm -hmm. are you trying to achieve? Which is your objective? And then we have a conversation about, you know, everything in between. Yeah. I am not a hypno analyst. I don't dwell into that type of thing as other people would do. So now we know today this is the problem. This is the what you're trying to achieve. This is your outcome goal. And I create a tailored treatment plan for that particular individual based on the objectives together we set out. And almost yeah. always the objectives have to be, you know, smart. They have to be measurable. They have to be attainable. Mm -hmm. They have to be specific. And that is one of the key elements of working with somebody new. And based on what they're trying to achieve, I build a treatment plan. And sometimes the hypnotherapy session would start with what has happened in the past week or two weeks since I've last seen them and mm. moves very easily into a uh, hypnosis script where we go through certain things they want to focus on. Or sometimes I am being. You know, I'm, I'm giving the opportunity for the client to take the lead. And if there is a need for more psychoeducation, there is a need more for mindfulness than it mm. is for hypnosis in that particular session, I would go into that direction. So okay. it's a very integrative approach that I take. And I yeah. subscribe to the idea that one is better than the other. I think a combination of things such as CBT techniques and cognitive behavioral therapy techniques for those of you who do not know and mindfulness and act which is acceptance commitment therapy yeah and hypnosis all of those together they would be used depending on the need of that particular client but yeah it sounds went like roundabout <laughs> quite a lot no but but i think this is quite important because i think what i'm what i'm hearing as well is that it's a very personalized thing as as all you know, these sorts of things are like, you know, certainly the way that I practice as a nutritionist is extremely personalized and it would be the same for you and understanding what the client's goals are and what, you know, understanding where their roadblocks are, you know, how, how their triggers yes. affect them and, and working out what's the best way uh, to kind of get them to the end result that it is that they're looking for. I suppose, Absolutely. You know. Yes. And I think one, one of the key elements for me when I work with anybody or when I'm trying to explain what, what I do to, to any living soul, which I do quite a lot, is <laughs> I am not there to do the work for them. And that yeah. is number one from, from day one is I, am, I want to guide you to give you the tools. I, it's as if I'm, I'm you in the mirror with more knowledge. Yeah. I, I don't do anything yeah. else. I'm not going to magically flash a wand and tomorrow you'll be 
sleeping right and you know i can't do those things unless those clients are understanding that they need to put in the work themselves absolutely and that, part of me what maybe this is slightly it's going off on a bit of a tangent but how does hypnotherapy for like because I, i imagine for, for for habits and things and correct me if i'm wrong in terms of like the hypnotherapy element of it it might be a bit more light touch compared to phobias for example where i can imagine there's a hev- is there a, often a heavier um component of hypnotherapy to dealing with phobias or it just depends on the person it depends on the person and i have had uh, clients in my practice who had uh, different degrees of phobias for mm. example to snakes and that's one of mine I'll hold my hand up to that one. Ooh. Terrified of snakes. We But yeah, we beautiful things to do together. Okay. Uh, so um, the hypnosis piece is the same in the sense okay. that you are there, you are present, you're fully conscious, you're fully interested in being present, right? In yeah. session. That's the number one criteria. What the suggestions are and what I'm taking you on a journey of in your imagination or visualization or mm. however you want to call it will be different depending on what we're trying to achieve. So, okay. for example, uh, if we are to go down the route of phobia of snakes, we would go through what is called desensitization, mm. i.e. we will find different ways in different grades of you starting from i'm very petrified of them to different scenarios where you're not so petrified so for example i'm sure you're petrified of them if they are in your lap but absolutely they, but if you know they are 3000 miles away you wouldn't be scared of a, mm-hmm. of them so we would be working on different scenarios where you would be in presence of a snake let's say mm-hmm. and then sometimes depending on the client and the availability we would also do or encourage in situ exposure Expo- yeah 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 and that's gradual everything is yeah. gradual and step by step so for example i will say you go to the local pet store see if they have a little lizard or a little snake mm-hmm. or a, and then see how you react and how your nervous system reacts to that and then we build and build yeah for me personally i think phobias and hypnosis go so hand in hand it's it certainly sounds like it yeah unbelievable how well they go together but at the same time you can apply hypnosis and utilize hypnosis for so many things from sleeping routine to stress management uh, weight management uh, even pain in the sense that the most recent research in in the in the field of pain showed very clearly that there isn't one neuro neurological pathway from where the pain is to your um, uh, brain registering it there are mm. many on and off switches and through hypnosis you can learn how to benefit from that i.e. make your pain feel less yeah i find that really interesting like it's funny you mention that because i was writing an article for my day job uh and and it was part of it was around medita- meditation in particular and how that can improve your sensitivity to pain in that it makes you less sensitive to pain yep um and and i imagine it also it can also really change your relationship to pain um and therefore as a result actually reduce the amount of pain that you're in i can't remember but there were just like there are certain uh, it, uh, it can just do some like the amount of control you have over your brain i think is is more than you actually think it is like it, is that something yeah okay yes i've hit yes that. yeah very much and and with i was nodding heavily guys <laughs> that's what i was <laughs> um and on pain specifically um they've done all sorts of clinical um and you know research work to understand if it actually works to the extent that there have been people who've had their teeth removed under hypnosis and not sedatives wow that's what that's i mean huge. it 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 can be used in many different ways without that element of uh myth of taking somebody's mind control and yeah 
it's it's not gonna happen you're always in control interesting yeah so i mean speaking of like being in control what made you see like what made you decide to to retrain um and and become a a cognitive behavior th- hypnotherapist oh if i tell you the story gosh i will tell you the story but it's just a funny one. <laughs> oh, i'm i'm settling in i'm settling in i'm getting comfy <laughs> Grab a cup of coffee, guys, or tea or whatever it is you're drinking. Um, I decided that I needed help um, from a motivation, exercise, weight point of view. And I was doing my own thing for for quite some time. And then I decided, very sillyly me, um, eh, I'll just go and go through hypnosis. They will come in, fix the brain. I will wake up. Poof. I'll have all the motivation in the universe. So that's exactly why I went for that particular idea of therapy. And I did my research and I found this particular hypnotherapist who happened to be an integrative psychotherapist. But I was looking at her particular profile just because of the hypnotherapy aspect and the weight management and motivation point of view. Mm. And I started the sessions and I think we've done hypno- hypnosis and hypnotherapy in the true but classic sense for a few sessions. And my expectations, although she mentioned them to me, were still unrealistic because I was expecting somebody to come in, rewire the brain, spit it out, all nice and dandy. I wasn't ready to do the work. Okay. And once that settled in, I was like, oh, Whew. This is really not what I was expecting because, again, mm. I wanted the magical thing that happens uh, online. And I was like, oh, gosh, this is actually, I have to learn things. And then I started what was my own journey to psychoeducation. I understood about the black and white thinking, the thought distortions, the good or bad, the food, the exercise. If you do this, it's good. If you do that, it's bad. And how that affects you, not in the sense that it is good or bad, but you perceive Mm. them as good and bad. Therefore, there are certain consequences. And then I got to learn more and more. And I think after six months of my own journey of learning myself, I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure there is a field here (laughs) that I can look into. And in um, high school, maybe I should have started with that. I studied philosophy quite a lot. And I also went to university and the admission process was a test in philosophy. So I was very familiar to philosophy, first and foremost, secondly to psychology. But psychology from the very superficial way you do it for a few classes and that's it. And you've learned uh, a little bit about it, but nobody really Mm. tells you what is happening in your a mind right so after the journey six months in i was like okay let's research what can i do what can i learn what is you know good for me what fits me as a personality and i was like you know i don't like the mystical mythical come to see me and hocus pocus you will be doing all of the things you want to do i want a very evidenced approach very scientific approach i want to know mm-hmm. Why am I using it? Why am I saying this to people? And psychoeducation. So I want to be able to tell people and educate them, as not as a teacher necessarily, but somebody who's gone through it and also trained in this field. And that's how I ended up with um, cognitive behavioral hypnotherapy from the UK College of Hypnosis and Hypnotherapy. I got their uh, you know, details and I stood with the idea for another two, three months. I was like, is this the best school? Are these the right people? Is their approach really evidence-based? Because that was important for me. Yeah. Would it make sense? Do I do it as a hobby? Do I do it as a practice? And then when I decided, you know what, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. And I was speaking Mm. to friends and family around and they were like, oh, wow, I didn't know about this. Or I didn't know about that. I realized there are just so many things we don't know as everyday you know jane and joe so that's why i went into cbh amazing and how long did you like like your personal journey with um with doing the the hypnotherapy aspect in the work like how long was that journey for you i continued so um i i was doing therapy for over two years 
yeah mm. all in all but I as I said I realized I wanted to get into learning it told my therapist at the time that I'm going to go for it she strongly recommended I do she was like yeah go mm. for it you will love it and I did and for a while I, I was as you know studying and doing uh, my own therapy because I was you know developing and learning new things yeah and I've only recently stopped the therapy aspect yeah I think one thing to mention here as specifically to CBH and also CBT is that the nature of the therapy is that it comes to an end perhaps quicker than in other areas of therapy and CBT for those of you who know it is normally maybe 10 sessions people would say that's the standard thing because it's all about this rewiring of your thoughts and um, actions so it's quite immediate if you put in the yeah yeah I was just about to say I feel like it's it's yeah the sense of putting in the work is quite important because I suppose it's the same sorry if my camera's jiggling around a bit there just because I'm getting a bit comfy but um I suppose you know even as a nutritionist like there's always this this wish that you can take a supplement or you can do a session and then either come out fixed or not need to put in the work outside of the sessions that you're in and actually it's I think it's really important like in talking therapy or in nutritional therapy hypnosis whatever like that you're using the tools that you're being given right and and actually putting them into everyday practice because your nutritionist isn't there to cook your meals you're not there for for the situations in which they want to bite their nails or in the amazonian rainforest where there are many many snakes like it's up to you to kind of really use the tools that you're being given to make the most out of the therapy that you're actually receiving right yeah absolutely absolutely and i think if you would ask me what what an ideal client looks like is that person mm. that is willing to put in the work because yeah it, it, as you said i can't be there for for their binge eating episodes or their you know self worth or their confidence levels or when they're getting ready for a new presentation they would have the tools in their toolkit but they will need to practice them and that's why one of the first things i say to people is you have to be willing to do homework that's what yeah it means you will have to do your own little experiments to see what your situation looks like will it trigger you will you not uh, mm-hmm. you know people who have social uh, phobia like uh, they don't want to speak to other people that they don't know but well, go and speak to somebody what happens because yeah it's thing. true it's, it's a what if what will happen you're going to go and speak to somebody say hi and they say nothing in return that's the worst that can happen yeah it's true yeah and i suppose like there's this 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 element of like uh, what if thinking and yeah and there's there's just so many like thought as you say thought distortions and i i learned a lot about thought distortions when when i've been going through my own therapy and this element of black and white thinking oh. and yeah and it's there there are just so many things that you need to think about and do the work on um but that doesn't mean that i think one thing that is perhaps really important to get across that you know and i know but the listeners may not know is that you have more power than you think to do all of that um yeah. you know you may think that you you need someone to kind of hold your hand every step of the way and and to an extent we are there to do that with you like we're here you know we're the ones that have trained and spent time and continue to spend time researching and thinking about these things but that ultimately you have the agency and the power to do a lot of this also for yourself um like you can do it once we give you the tools you you are competent enough to go and do this for yourself absolutely absolutely and that is another reason why i decided to to train with the school that i did and in the way that i did is because the ethos of the of the school is you can well they they say they can because they believe they can but the actual quote is from virgil the mm-hmm. uh, the um, the greek uh, philosopher who literally said you can because you believe you can so yeah. as long as you understand your sphere of control and control is within you for you with mm. you then you are able to achieve things 
And you can change the habits, you can adapt to, you know, stress levels, you can manage it better, you can eat according to what you need to eat and have a healthy relationship with food. Those things are within people's control. I think it just becomes very murky in everyday mm. life when you imagine that your sphere of control is wider than it is. Right. And narrowing down to understand, it will sound very cliche, so bear with me, guys. And I mm. was like almost throwing up when I heard it the first time, but it actually is very true. The moment you understand that control to change is within you, you'll yeah. have a light bulb moment. Yeah. Yeah, Nobody I get that. To, to, to do that for you. Nobody will be there to... You know, it's just that, you, yourself, and yourself. I was going to say, that was no, that was not as cheesy as I thought you were going to go. So actually, it wasn't too painful for me personally anyway. But it's true. Like, I thought it was really interesting the way that you referred to what is in your sphere of control and actually narrowing that down. And I think that goes back to the conversation we had in a previous episode where I was talking about, like, there is a lot in life you can't control. Like you can't control a lot of external things, but a lot of internal things you actually can. Uh, so, you know, in terms of what you put in your body, the way that you talk about yourself, um, you, you know, the the, the self-belief, like you were just saying in that quote from Virgil about believing that you can do these things are actually what propels you to do them in the end. It's not about anything else. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And the one thing I want to add onto, onto that one is you do have the power, you, the listener, you, me, Mira, everybody has the mm. power to control their reaction to something mm -hmm. which is external. So one of the elements of, of CBT is the fact that your system of beliefs, your thoughts would dictate how you react to something because the same event can happen to both of us we can be present yeah. in the same moment have the same exact experience but i might be crying you might be happy or you mm -hmm. might be indifferent and i should be in tears sure. and that, that has nothing to do with the event itself because the event is the event it's mm. just the way we relate to it because my system mm. of beliefs might be different from yours. I mm. see it as a catastrophe and I'm like catastrophizing about it whilst you're like, you know, it happens. So what? Eh, life goes on. So those mm. kinds of things are still within our sphere of control because we can learn what would be the helpful, healthy way to react to things. So that is within the control, although the absolute event is external. Totally. Yeah. And I, I find that, yeah, it's been a useful learning lesson. I think in COVID, like for me personally, and like being at home with family and just like, yeah, learning to not react, so even though as tempting as it is, like when family members wind you up or the wrong way, or you've just spent too much time with them. I mean, thankfully for the majority of us, like we're starting to come out of that phase now. But actually that leads me very nicely, that rambling leads me really nicely onto my, one of my other questions, which was, you know, obviously with COVID, like a lot of things switched to them being online and typically talking therapies or like psychological therapies tend to be done in person. Mm. Do you find that they're still as even with things like hypnosis that they can still be effective being online? Yeah. Yeah. I, I trained in the middle of pandemic, as in I started my training in probably one of the second lockdowns we had in London. Mm. And I did all of my studying, all of my volunteering with, uh, so I needed a lot of volunteers and case studies in order to fulfill the practical aspect of my studies. And all of that was online, absolutely mm. all of it uh, from start to finish. And currently all of my services are available online only because there is no evidence that they, one is less efficient than the other. Mm -hmm. And what we've learned is that people who are in their comfortable environment, particularly the ones that I tend to work with the most, uh, mm -hmm. be more receptive to what happens in their environment already. And okay. it's one less hassle to go yeah. somewhere. So Absolutely. convenience, as you know, is a, key, is a key driver of our everyday society. And there is no body of evidence to say in person is better than it is online. As long as your internet connection is secure and I utilize um, 
platforms which are designed for talking therapies and they are oh, cool. encrypted yeah. and, and uh, I have to have a certain um, high standards in terms of how mm -hmm. I manage information and how we have our sessions. Yeah, I think if you would ask a different therapist, they would probably say it's better in person for people who need to come out of their environment in order to have yeah. a session. Yeah, that makes sense. It kind of leads me nicely onto my next question. I mean, you know, because obviously I was doing I was doing my homework. I was reading, you know, more about your approach and all that kind of thing. And I noticed that you said something really interesting about when life feels really complicated and we feel like a passenger. How do you get someone back in the driving seat? Or how do you, mm. if a client comes to you saying, I feel like I'm a passenger of my own life, what do you say to a client to put them back in the driver's seat? I would ask them to look at what is within their control. Mm. First of all, I would I would start from from there. Because, you know, people say, I feel like I'm a, I'm a passenger, I don't have any control, I'm overwhelmed, I feel so stressed out about this new job, or I'm going for an interview and I'm not going to be good at it. And I would just ask them, okay, forget about all of the noise of can'ts, shoulds, and won'ts, and just mm -hmm. tell me the control that you have. Yeah. And I would start building that area and that focus and locum of control from that, you know, you're in control now. You decided to come here. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's yeah. within your control, right? And then building it upwards from there in the sense of where would you like to be once you're back in your driver's seat? Mm. And using the car analogy, what does your car look like? How will it be? Which color will it be? And mm. what are you going to feel like, think like, behave like once you're back into your driver's seat? Because that's what we are doing as therapists, I think, in general. We are so in doubt yeah. so that you understand there is a different way of doing things. So you get yeah. a little bit doubtful of the things you, you are doing now and they don't work for you. But we are also instilling hope. Yeah, That's the thing. We, you need to look at it in the sense of more hopeful. So okay, it doesn't all have to be dark and gloom and sad mm. and I can't be back into my driver's seat. And then we, we build, it's building blocks. And I don't want to say, the one thing that I hate is to generalize because there are so many facets. Each yeah. individual has their own type of history, their own uh, beliefs, their own understanding. So I don't want to generalize, but I would start from focus. Mm. focus on the things you can control the things who are within your area immediately the ones that you can identify easily i'm in control yeah. of taking the pen and holding it kind of thing yeah and then building it and making it gradually more important yeah that's a, yeah and i kind of love that and i think what's really complimentary about what you and i do is that it's so it is often very goal oriented and I personally do quite well with goals like yeah. you know I, I love a goal like yeah you know and I know what I'm working towards um and I think that's why you know you and I complement each other so well is because we are goal oriented we you know it's not necessarily that we're looking for like very very specific outcomes but we're looking I suppose and correct me if I'm wrong for that moment when like a client can look back at what they've achieved and feel like I, I feel like I'm somewhere where I want to be like mm. this is this feels much more comfortable I'm happier I'm more settled I'm less anxious mm -hmm. you know what I, you know I feel better and I feel more confident and better within myself like these are all outcomes I think that we we both yeah. of us definitely hope for in our clients and then one of the last questions I asked that particularly CB CBH related um and that was cognitive behavioral hypnotherapy um what were some of the biggest learnings that you've kind of taken away throughout your own experience with uh cb cbh and also as a as as a newly qualified practitioner what are the kind of things that you really learned about it for me uh it was predominantly understanding but truly understanding not on a you know hypothetical level but truly understanding mm the relationship between thought, behavior, emotions, not necessarily mm. in disorder, but what is the link 
what mm. why are they interlinked how do they work together how do they affect everyday life my life mm. um, and also in this was the learning of experiencing emotion without going into down the rabbit hole of emotions what they are how you experience them i can tell you hand on heart i was one of those people that besides the top three happy sad angry then right. yeah if you ask me something else i was like oh, okay or if you if somebody would tell me on the street you know i feel very anxious today prior to doing my own work and learning about cbh i would be like oh i'm so sorry for you but i didn't understand what it was okay yeah i had no rec- no understanding no grasp of it and then when i went through this whole uh, learning from so many different aspects i was like oh emotional dissociation exists mm. i e you don't have a you don't have the vocabulary and you don't have the understanding of what it is you experience yeah. them but you have no way of connecting them to your thoughts or your behaviors because the link yeah. is missing yeah i get i get you yeah and there are very many reasons for that uh, to happen so i don't want to go down that that could be a different episode completely no like, we should totally do that as yeah. an episode like yeah for sure that because was like i man yeah yeah so i carry on no 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 carry on Th- that was the first one that i needed to learn i think yeah um has there been anything that's been like i suppose that's given you like this unexpected moment of joy and as i like in terms of like when you've made that connection because i think for me i'm trying to think for me like as a good example um like for me for example i found like eating healthily can be really enjoyable and that was like a kick mm. and did you ever have a moment that was kind of a bit like that Yes and excuse my french guys and no disrespect to french language but the aha moment for me was when i realized that that's not my shit take it back yeah yeah and there are many ways that we get overwhelmed by other people's reactions emotions thoughts things that they don't necessarily want us to carry as our load but we do because yeah of whatever many reasons we were educated like that we trained ourselves to be like that and the moment when i realized that that's not for me to carry that whole idea mm-hmm. of this is where my focus ends my area yeah. this is where my boundaries are and this is where i as a responsible human end that's not yeah. shit that yeah. was the aha moment and I, i have to say that i i do slip <laughs> even now i do slip back into taking you know oh i don't know getting overworked <laughs> by somebody yeah. else's uh, something that is happening or words that are being addressed to me and then i have a moment of that's not my shit let it go yeah. why carry yeah. a backpack when it's not yours live it <laughs> live yeah. it yeah yeah that was one of the aha moments of joy yeah yeah Beautiful. yeah that's it's super powerful isn't it it just takes that weight off like especially if you're like i don't know about you but you're a bit of a people pleaser i know i certainly fall into that category like absolutely um and just understanding i suppose boundaries you know mm-hmm. in that respect and we are, i mean we could talk about boundaries for days um oh, yes we have yeah to, we have to I'm so excited we should uh, we absolutely and specifically should. as women we have to because some of us are really crap at setting boundaries yeah. historically speaking it's just we were trained not to have any to please everybody no yeah <laughs> no it's so true it's yeah. so so true um Okay and I think that's kind of most of my like CBT H like but I'm interested to know more about you as a person so tell me one random fact about yourself it can be anything at all I actually have two Oh I, even better I couldn't decide between the two so Okay one is a blessing and a and a curse all together mm-hmm. literally all together is the fact that I remember everything Oh I'm so jealous <laughs> don't be <laughs> and when i mean everything is like yeah. i remember the song i was singing when i was 6 and it was mariah carey and what song it was and unfortunately i remember it as i was singing it back then <laughs> with wow. really poor word choice because i couldn't understand everything she was singing mm-hmm. about so uh, that's not you know it's it's not helpful sometimes but uh, yeah, i just of course 
I realized over the years that I do remember if we had a conversation or if we had even better, if we had an audio video type interaction, then mm. I will remember it for a very long time. Probably wow. forever. Because I'm a video person uh, in the sense of visual. I would see yeah. where I've written it, where it's been on the page type of thing. But also if I hear it. So I remember things from both ends. Luckily for me, luckily, my brain has a way to also make sure that I don't store unnecessary things. Unless okay. I go fishing for them in the future. So, so you can actually remember like look at a page of, or like be writing notes kind of put it away for a week and then yeah if I say to you oh, I will tell you, know you what it's, yeah it's like oh yes wow. I've, I've written it and it's on the top right corner and it's in whatever ink and yeah that's how I that's how I knew most of my uh, lectures through university wow. and masters and everything you would ask me where is the specific paper on investor relations and I will go fetch it in my head because it's on so that maybe, type of yeah. paper yeah I mean, I get that it's not always great, but like, yeah, I totally but, respect that. Yeah, I totally, you know, I keep also random things and songs and f things that you don't particularly want to keep in your head for so long. Yeah. That's why it's like, okay, how long can I store it? But I think uh, with age, I, I tend to let go of the things that are not useful anymore. Yeah. And I, I let them, I let them back. Yeah. And the second, the second thing that I wanted to share is, um, tend to know too much about cars really not because I wanted to it was never a dream of mine but I was always okay. surrounded by people who were very 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 petrol headed or car enthusiasts so not cars in the sense of you know that's a nice Porsche or something like that it's in regards to the mechanics and the hydraulics and both oh, that's kind of and that's kind of cool that you know that though like I've always wanted to know how cars work, but I've never like, I don't know, it, I need, it needs to be explained to me in a very specific way if I'm going to understand it, otherwise I'll, it just goes up my brain. But I am guilty, a uh, small confession from me, of sometimes watching this show called Wheeler Dealers with my dad, where it's like, have you heard of it? It's like yes. where like they, they buy the cars and then the mechanic fix it. Yes. And I actually quite, it's a bit like watching a DIY program. I just enjoy the process of watching him fix it and him explaining to me the yeah. mechanic of what he's actually doing but it, yeah, it, is, it, it is it is a fun field uh not when you're you know driving with your family members and all you hear about is oh like, yeah yeah it's an, and I thought I completely didn't hear it <laughs> no. yeah no your brain your your super brain definitely still took it I'm in through and what happens yeah yeah you know what's so funny like I think in my the way that my brain works is like I do very specific things and I think this is like a bit of a trauma brain response where like especially at work if I am focused on doing one thing I will forget about everything else that I've done so like with you mm. you know like I, I will create a spreadsheet of like all these different things and then I'll have to move on to like three other emergency deadlines yeah. and I will forget that I did that spreadsheet last week it's just gone and like my my boss at work, but yeah, but you created it last. I'll be like, what spreadsheet? What spreadsheet? I ain't got a clue what they're talking about. And they will see the panic in my eyes because I've forgotten it. And they're like, you did it last week, and I'm like, did I? And then they have to anyway. And for me, I've just realised it's the way that my brain dumps. Like when it gets mm. overwhelmed, it just dumps. That's how it deals with it. And that's it's it's not ideal, but I've I've found ways around it to to basically mean like, okay, I write stuff down because that's. You know, that's how I, I remember information best. Um, the same, but it's, same. Yeah. The best way to remember is to to write it down. That's why the visual aspect of where it is, is the, with a, you know, notepad, and it just helps a lot to write it's it down. So, yeah. Well, which is why it's so useful that you do remember this stuff, because I had to ask you, Denise, do you remember where you wrote the plans down for the podcast episodes? Because I can't find it. In my... <laughs> and then Denise very kindly sent me a picture of exactly her, where it was in her notepad. So I actually knew what the hell I've been doing for the last three episodes, which is a bit of a relief. <laughs> so we can just, we can't, we compliment each other. It's all good. It's all yes, good. Yeah, that's the, the beauty of it. And that's, I think, what we're trying to, to make everybody understand through this. It's just, 
there is no right or wrong way. They are just helpful and unhelpful. Ways. Unhelpful, absolutely. And depending on who you are, what your you know reality, something that is very helpful for me might be completely unhelpful for somebody else. And it's just yeah. about, I think, giving ourselves permission to just be. We are not. Yeah. You're not human doers. We are human beings. So we need to. Yeah. Be. We do. And I think like, I think that's so important that that you just mentioned that with helpful and unhelpful, because I was actually thinking about that in this episode and actually the last one that we just um, did where you interviewed me, because I think that's so, so important. Like this idea of like, what works for one person won't necessarily work for another person. What works for me might not work for someone else. And it absolutely is about what's helpful and unhelpful. And even when like, you're in that moment and you know how you were talking about how you learn to like not take on other people's shit it's having being in that moment and be able to say is this thing that I'm about to do or about to feel or about to say or whatever helpful or unhelpful mm. and having that micro pause I think has been one of the power most powerful like tools that I've actually had most recently yeah. to do stuff it's like oh I'm about to uh not eat properly because I've decided I'm too busy. I'm like, okay, is that helpful? Or is that unhelpful? And if it's unhelpful, what can you do to make it more helpful? You know, and I mm-hmm. and there's something extremely important. And I think it's actually a, a recurring, it will become a recurring theme mm-hmm. in the podcast, this idea of helpful and unhelpful. Mm-hmm. And the fact that that looks different for each of us. Absolutely. And I think what it all pins down is awareness, is the self-awareness, yeah. is being aware of your thoughts and being aware of your emotions and being aware that you're in a situation and what is happening. Because I th- coming back to that question that you've asked me about, what would I say to somebody who's not in the driver's mm. seat and they feel like a passenger, is this awareness? That's why I was maybe wrongly using the word focus, but it's just becoming very aware mm. of the reality of what would be helpful for that particular individual and what would be unhelpful for them Mm. and be aware of how the mind and the body works. And for those of you who are not seeing me, I'm basically trying to demonstrate how (laughs) the back of your head and the body is connected because that's, you know, the extreme highway where everything is processed and we end up living either in our heads or in our bodies. We feel too much, but we don't think about it or we just think about things and we don't feel emotions. Well, we're not winning at life if we do either. Yeah, it's a really, really good point. Um, This idea of either thinking or feeling and and not being able to to hold space for both um, is actually really, really important um yeah and it's I think it's it comes we'll definitely have to come back to this I think in subsequent podcasts around this idea of just the the the, just that micro pause is so important and is so telling and is what flips it for everybody yeah like I don't I don't you know I I even wonder even if we're going to really have to get someone in to talk maybe or maybe you can talk about actually about resilience and what Mm. resilience actually is but you know, I'm I'm reading really randomly. I'm reading a book, or I've been listening to an audio book that I've binged this whole weekend about um, this lady who was violently attacked by her partner and how she recovers. And it's a true story, but it's a story about resilience. And I think what's really interesting is is like I think even for her, although she had to dig very very deep to find the resilience, it's about those micro pauses of being like, does this help me or does this mm. not help me? And and trying to lean on the things that that actually will help in the long term even Mm. yeah like they don't and they don't have to be very big things they can be small things yeah um and I think what I would like to say in complementing that and maybe this would be a good way to to pause this particular perfect you know episode, episode is if something worked or didn't work for you in the past it doesn't mm. mean that it won't work or not work in the future. So I think amongst everything else, in, and very important in, in resilience and other other such elements, is this giving yourself permission to revisit mm. and to think of the things like, oh, when I used to do X in the past, I was feeling so and so. and But it didn't work then. That doesn't mean that it can't work now. 
You don't mm-hmm. have to always reinvent the wheel. You don't have to always yeah. look for the next best shiny little new thing. It can be something that for whatever strange reason wasn't the right thing at that moment in time. And then yeah. you can look back at it and say, yeah, actually doing some, I don't know, gardening might be the best way for me to get over a close person that yeah. I lost away because that's my way of reconnecting with it. Whatever, I'm just making this up now. No, of course, yeah. But what I'm saying yeah. is giving permission to go and say, you know what, if it didn't work back then, there's no particular reason why I always have to search for the newness. But it can also be something to revisit. Yeah, I really like that. It's just about yeah. being prepared to experiment, I guess. Yes, and not having to be, you know, so driven by new necessarily. Mm. It can also be just, you know, recycle in everyday mm-hmm. life. Use a glass. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to well, be tough. yeah. I think this is a perfect way to kind of draw it to a close. Like, thanks so much, Denise, for uh, your incredible wisdom. And I think this has opened up so many different themes that we can we can come back to for future episodes. So, guys, if you like what you're hearing, give us a little follow. Let us know in the comments if there's anything that you want either of us or both of us to cover. We really hope you enjoyed it. And we look forward to speaking to you soon. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>